Hello, everyone, and welcome to Heads Up, the weekly webcast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel, migraine strategist, founder of the Facebook group Migraine Nation, and chronic daily migraine survivor. I am super excited to tell you that I am here today with Dr. Tim Smith. Hi, Dr. Smith. How are you? Doing well. Thank you for having me again. So we are very familiar with Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith is a regular here because of his extensive experience in clinical trials related to migraine medications. He is the CEO of Study Metrics Research, and he is also the vice president of the National Headache Foundation. So we have him on whenever we have something excited to tell you about a new medication or research related to a new medication. And he is extremely informative, and I'm always super excited to hear what he has to say. So we come to you today with some new data related to intranasal zevagepant. This is not something that is available to us yet. This is not a drug that has yet been approved, but it's the pivotal trial that is going to make it so that it will eventually be available to us, hopefully, and it's very interesting data. So we wanna chat with you about it and make sure that you hear about it first here on Heads Up. So um, I think we should start by just saying that we've said that it's an intranasal mode of delivery for this new migraine medication. Um, but let's talk about what it is. What is Zavagepan, Dr. Smith? So Zavagepan is, it's, uh, it's a new g uh, okay. I think most of our listenership and viewership are, are familiar with g -pants. Uh the Nurtec uh, ODT that's right. uh, been on the market for a year and a half, uh, Ubrelvi about the same time, a little longer, I believe. And then mm -hmm. more recently, the Culipta or Atojapant, which is marketed as a preventive. Um, and those are all the uh, so-called G-Pant drugs. They are what we call small molecular weight um, uh, CGRP blockers. So they block the CGRP receptor mm -hmm. and uh, it's, they're orally administered, the ones that are marketed. And so this is a, a, a another derivative of that GPANT inhibition, the, the CGRP inhibition by a small molecular weight uh, molecule. So you can think of it as kind of like a modified Nurtec, for example. Right. Is it the first one of the GPANTs to come out that is delivered intranasally? Uh, yes, it's the first okay. one that uh, we've done trials on. It's not, as you said in your opening, it's not marketed yet. Right. Um, don't know when it will be marketed, but the results of the trial we're talking about today are their big pivotal you know, study results uh, as the first, uh, uh, um, uh, well, they had one previous uh, trial uh, that studied three different doses, 5, 10, and 20 milligrams. And from that study, it was a large study. Um, they, uh, they zeroed in on 10 milligram as the most optimum dose. So that's uh, what they went back and did this study with, uh, with the 10 milligram dose uh, versus placebo in a large trial. And this is their pivotal data that they will use to go to the FDA for approval. Okay, so we have so many new medications. It's just an amazing time to be alive as someone with migraine. We have so many new medications that we're coming out and announcing to everyone. And so I'm always going through the data and saying, what is special about this one? And I want to tell everyone that what's special about this one has to do with how quickly it works and a couple really interesting endpoints. So let's start by saying, why is the intranasal delivery interesting? Why do we like that as people with migraine? And so as uh, we know that uh, migraine is, uh, has a lot of gastrointestinal side of our uh, symptoms that go along with it. It's not just a headache. Right. You don't have to tell our you know, viewership that, but uh, for people that don't understand migraine, it's kind of a total body uh, disruption and uh, the intestinal symptoms are, significant, including sometimes pretty profound nausea and even vomiting uh, that can go on for hours and hours or even more than a day. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to swallow tablets or take medications right. uh, when that's going on. It's that, that brain gut sort of relationship that uh, a lot of people are talking about now. And uh, it's never more apparent in any medical condition, uh, more apparent than in migraine. 
it's a serious impediment to your quality of life. And it's also a serious impediment to treatment sometimes. Right. And so when we think about trying to bypass the intestinal tract, the nasal roots becomes an attractive, uh, an attractive way because you can, if they formulate the medication right, you can uh, deliver that medication across the nasal mucosa. It penetrates into the bloodstream and, and, and directly to the brain and it bypasses the intestinal tract. So if people are sick or they're not absorbing their oral medicines, as is the case many times, then uh, they can get uh, still get significant relief, uh, maybe even better relief and faster relief because you do bypass that gut. Uh, you know, so where t- tablets have to dissolve, get absorbed, pass through the liver, circulate through your system, and then eventually get to the brain where they have their effect. And this kind of short uh, is a shortcut for that uh, process. Okay, and then. This this also helps, does it not, with uh, speed of onset? I don't want to ruin our next question, but doesn't an intranasal delivery uh, sort of help it work quicker for us? Well, and, and I think it does, and it's uh, primarily because you do, you know, short, sort of bypass all of that, you know, the, the many steps to get uh, an orally delivered drug into your system that we were just talking about. You know, yeah. with a nasal spray, if it gets into the nasal mucosa and trans- it gets absorbed across the nasal mucosa, then it's in the bloodstream. It goes straight to the brain. Okay. And there are even some theories that some medicines may travel along the olfactory nerves and go straight to the brain. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's, you know, uh, mostly theoretical and some animal models. But if, if that does happen, then you can think of that as kind of like that super highway straight to the brain, right? you know, to have that effectiveness. And it gives you a chance to get much more rapid results. You know, we, we look at oral deliveries, oral drugs, and, and we're looking at results in an hour to two hours. And with nasal sprays, we hope to improve on that. Okay. So let's get to uh, the data that that just recently came out here. So what uh, were the endpoints that they found with Zavagepant, the intranasal intranasal Zavagepant, excuse me, that uh, what were the endpoints that would be most interesting to people like us that have migraine? Well, they look at the usual, you know, uh, endpoints that we are always reporting on is that two-hour pain freedom, two-hour pain relief, and then uh, out to 24 hours, and we see that as the primary endpoints for oral drugs. Right. Um, and it, it beat, uh, it was significant at all of those endpoints. But uh, the exploratory endpoints of pain relief by 15 minutes. Right. So this is 15 minutes, spray that in your nose, the clock starts ticking. And uh, the patients uh, had the statistically significant uh, uh, pain relief response as early as 15 minutes which was the earliest endpoint, earliest time point that we measured mm-hmm. you know, on, on the electronic diaries. And you have to remember what we do is we give the dose, the patient administers, and then the diary, you know, and they hit the start button and the diary alerts them at 15 and 30 and 45 minutes to, you know, rate their pain at right. those times. And by 15 minutes, it was already uh, uh, more than twice as many people uh, were uh, getting pain relief as compared to the placebo so that was uh, that was very encouraging news, and not you know it, it sort of proves that that point we're trying to make with the uh, with the with the nasal uh, delivery. I found that very impressive. Uh, I was trying to think uh, if I had ever experienced pain relief at 15 minutes from anything. I, I had to go back pretty far. So I I found that endpoint very impressive as as someone with migraine. So so go ahead. What is the next one? And then uh, the other, uh, I th- the one that I found, uh, you know, super encouraging was returning to normal function in 30 minutes. Right. And, you know, we, we, there have been some oral drugs that we've seen that uh, we, you know, uh, were able to show some return to function in an hour to 90 right. minutes. And, uh, but to be functioning normally in 30 minutes, that's a pretty outstanding result and very encouraging. And it was statistically significant. So it wasn't just a you know, just an observational thing. Mm-hmm. This was uh, this was for real, and and uh, I think we can have confidence in those numbers. Yeah, those were two endpoints that I wasn't used to seeing, and that really stood out to me when I was looking at this data. Um, that was why I said when I asked that question, I don't normally formulate it that way. I said, "What are the most exciting things for for someone like me?" So 
I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, returning to, to normal function within 30 minutes and, and noticing a pain difference uh, that fast was, was quite, quite awesome. Were there any uh, endpoints that you wanted to, uh, to bring up? Any others? Uh, just that uh, that they, you know that it's it's good to be fast, but uh, if it's fast and not sustained, then right. that's uh, that leaves something to be desired because mm -hmm. then the patient has to redose and redose. But uh, what the uh, what the investigative team on this study showed is that uh, patients um, uh, their their pain freedom uh, response is sustained through 24 hours. So that means as long if they're like if they get pain-free within two hours, for example, uh, they're highly likely to continue to be pain-free at 24 hours. And, and uh, that was a, a, a significant finding and, and the statistics proved out that that was for real as well. Okay, that uh, is awesome. So on the flip side of this, what side effects or, um, or other things were seen with Zavage Pant? What problems that people have? Yeah, so we know we know that the the G pant uh, class as a whole is 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 pretty low in it in, in side effect profile, and uh, that's the case with uh, Zavegipant as well. Uh, the the in fact the 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 most uh, frequently seen um, side effects from uh, from this from Zavegipant nasal spray in this trial were had more to do with the nasal administration you know when you yeah. when you spray something in your nose you get a little bit at least some of it drains down the back of your throat and mm -hmm. hits your taste buds on the back of your tongue so so uh, you know a little more than five or uh, this, this we look at these in these early trials we look at uh, side effects that occurred at five percent or more for patients and and uh, that was the case for the abnormal taste uh, in that that happens with all, you know, not to right. minimize it, but that happens with all nasal spray studies. Some people get a little nasal congestion just because you're putting a chemical on your, on your nasal membranes. Mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise, the, any adverse events look just like the oral G pants. Okay. All right. Um, and what we should mention that is this only being tested for acute treatment of migraine and not preventive? Actually, they they have formulated Zavegipant uh, in a like a gel capsule that, oh. uh, and there's an ongoing study now uh, dosing once a day with okay. uh, oral Zavegipant uh, as a preventive. We don't have any data on that. The study just launched a few months ago, okay. and it's ongoing. Uh, perhaps in several months, we'll have some top line data from that as well. But uh, that's encouraging, and it tells you a little bit. When, when they came up with this molecule, I think it's uh, the flexibility of it to be able to be absorbed across your nasal membranes, but then also have a pharmacokinetic profile that would allow you to uh, dose once a day orally, then you get kind of potentially you could get the best of both worlds. You could get a rapid onset product administered uh, intranasally. And if you we use our imagination that if it does prove out to be very good uh, as a as a daily preventive, then it could be the same molecule used um, just in an oral formulation as right. a as a preventive. We never know how these things are going to turn out, and we don't know what the company's going to want to apply to do with these molecules, and and then we don't know how the FDA is going to going to you know pass judgment on them. But mm -hmm. that's one you know, possibility of how, you know, how it could turn out. So okay. um, encouraging stuff. My next question is, is do we know based on the mechanism of action of this medication or other G pants, if we're going to be able to use them in any of the other headache disorders uh, that people in our audience might have besides migraine, might they be applicable to them? And I, you know, the straight up answer on that is there, there could be applicability. We do not have those uh, study results at this time, uh, but we know that CGRP is involved in uh, cluster headache, for example. Yeah. We know it's involved in uh, TMJ disorder, as a matter of right. fact, and it may have a role in post-traumatic headache and and not only on headache pain disorders, but it may have some uh, role in other pain disorders as right. well. So 
so we we may just be scratching the surface with blocking CGRP. There, you know, we we need to do the studies and and find out, uh, you know, what the the true uh, sort of portfolio could look like for CGRP blockade. Okay. And then my last question to you is, do you know if there's any plans either with Savage Pant or any of the other G pants to test them in people in our, this is for people in our audience who might be under 18 or, or people who have kids uh, under 18 who uh, are really looking for new medication options? And the answer is yes, they will be tested. Um, one of the things that uh, for disorders like migraine that affect adults and children both, the FDA has a requirement that these companies uh, uh, do clinical trials on children because, you know, you, you, it's, it's a common childhood disorder. Right. And if, if a medication works well in adults uh, and there's a possibility it could work well in children, uh, we need to know that. Okay. All right. Is there anything else you'd like to add on our discussion of this new data related to intranasal Zavagipan? I guess the only thing I would just add is, you know, it's sort of, uh, I think people a lot of times don't relish the idea of spraying medicine in their nose. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, I think our, my, a lot of our migraine population, especially the, the high end, more severe population uh, would do anything it takes to get rid right. of a severe migraine. Uh, no but given the option, people might, uh, you know, if they, if unless they're nauseated and, and really vomiting, they w they would prefer to swallow pills. So I mm -hmm. think nasal spray versions of medicines are important, and they'll be part of the toolkit. Fortunately, our toolkit's just gotten a lot bigger over the last few years, and so yes, this, could, <laughs> this could broaden it even more. So that's encouraging. Yes. Okay. Well. Uh, thank you everyone for listening uh, about the data behind this new medicine. As we said, it is not yet available, not yet approved by the FDA, but this is a pivotal, pivotal study um, that is on a new medicine and we wanted to make sure you heard about it. We were the first to bring it to you and uh, thanks for listening today. And thank you, Dr. Smith, for being here. And everyone, please join us again next week on Heads Up the weekly webcast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation.